If you have your Bibles, your Kindles, your phones, whatever you guys use these days, I'm going to go to the book of James, and I want you to go to the very first chapter, James chapter 1. And what I'm going to be speaking about today is turning your trials into triumphs. I was talking with Josh last week, and I said, you know, I, I know and can sense God's moving in the church here, and I know you guys probably had a wonderful Easter. Um, and he said, absolutely. And I, and I knew that, just I could sense in my prayers. And I said, you know, the biggest problem that we have in our churches is after a big day like Easter like that, when everybody's so emotionally ramped up that within the week, Satan attacks the families in our congregation. It never fails. Something happens or somebody gets, gets something thrown at them and their joy gets snuffed out really quick. And you know, Jesus warned us about this when he gave us the parable of the soils. He told us that some of the seed would fall on ground that would hit the rocks and would just dry up and go away and some of it would get choked out by the pressures of life. That happens. And the thing that we have to do as a congregation is to remind people that just because they come forward and just because they give their heart to Christ doesn't mean that there's not going to be a struggle. It doesn't mean that there's still not consequences in their lives for their past sin, that there are things, repercussions in their lives. We sometimes are so anxious to get a convert, so anxious to see revival break out that we forget to give them that key component that yes, you will still have trouble in this life but as Jesus said, take heart, I've overcome the world. Yeah. You can have a joy in your life, and that joy can be made complete even in the midst of your trials. Yes. And if you don't have that, that component, then when problems come in, the people will come back and think that you sold them a bad bill of goods, and then they leave twice as bad as they were before they ever gave their heart to Christ, and then it's going to be harder to bring them back into the fold as they wander and they keep looking for that truth. So I think it's important that you as the congregation... Look at this, and, we, and he, maybe even today, maybe you're going through something right now, and it's hard because you don't want to bring anybody else down. You know, a lot of good, joyous singing. Singing was great. Service has been awesome. Let's hope the preaching holds up. Amen? And then we have something come up, and you say, you know, I don't want to be, there's two kinds. You know, sometimes people bring everything, and then there's the people that say, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. I don't want to bring anybody down. I don't want to share anything. And then they keep this private burden held to their heart, and we can never help people like that then. I used to tell my congregation, I don't know if I don't know. And I can't read your mind. If you're struggling with something, if you feel like you're being ostracized, you don't feel like you're connecting, let me know. Because sometimes it's just a little something. You know, I've been in that place too. I'll share a story with you when I get through this in a moment. But I've been there. And I've been in places where I felt like I was the outsider looking in. And sometimes we're so concerned because Satan is whispering in our ear, your sin is so bad, the problems you're going through are so grave, nobody's going to want to deal with you. Why don't you just get out now while it's getting as good? And just leave it alone. See, we can't be that way. We've got to make sure we don't want to overwhelm anybody either. So it has to be natural. And we just have to let people know that they're loved and make sure that we make we, we at least some kind of touch, a letter, a card, taking them out for coffee, something. And then let's learn from what the Bible teaches us about being in trials and temptations. So in James chapter 1, James, of course, has his traditional greeting here. A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. My translation might just be a shade off, but pretty close. To the 12 tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. Now the next three verses is where I want us to focus. Consider it a joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and I thank you, Lord, for the message that you laid on my heart. I pray that as you want me to share and as you've given this to me, Father, that it will will come as you, as you want it to be, and that the hearts that need to be ministered to, Lord, you know the needs of everybody in this congregation. Lord, I just am the vessel. Please help me to speak your words as you have me to lead in this. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Spirit. We thank you for what you've given us today in this wonderful service. And I just thank you, Lord, for an awesome church, for the leadership here. And I pray that the word will minister as you call it out to minister to the hearts that are here in Jesus' name. Amen.
So the first thing I want you to, to see here is to understand when we go through a trial, maybe you're going through something right now. Maybe there's somebody in your family that's suffering. How do we turn our trials into triumphs? The first part is probably one of the hardest things for us to grasp. And he says here, consider it a joy whenever we experience various trials. Well, the first thing we have to do is check our attitude. You see, we're gonna have our greatest evangelistic effect when people see us going through the same thing they're going through, but our response is different than theirs. Does that make sense? When we change the way we respond to the blows in this life, and every one of us gets punched in the mouth from time to time, I don't care how good you are, how much you give, how much you're in attendance here, all the great things that you do, life still hurts at times. Things happen, and it happens to the unsaved, and it happens to the saved. But for the saved people, we should understand that this is not the final destination. This is not our resting place, and there's nothing that Satan can do to us in this life that's gonna take us off the path in what is our best life that's yet to come, and that's when we cross over from the land of the dying to the land of the living forevermore, as Brother Gary sang, where we've, we will be in victory with everyone there that has passed on before us. Right. That is what we have to look forward to. My daughter, when the floor started collapsing, good point. She's got a friend there who's a really good handyman. He's licensed and he can do just about anything, but he needed a hand and we're trying to save money. We're trying to help her, so my son's over there. But the gentleman that's working on her house doesn't know the Lord. He's kind of an agnostic. He has no clue. He kind of wants to believe, but he doesn't know. And there's been a lot of things we've needed him for because I'm not the best. I can do little things. I can YouTube some things, but you don't want to put a power tool in my hand because I might hurt something. So, and Devin is a little better at that than I am, my son. So I told my daughter and I said, you know, he's going to see this and his name's Justin if you want to pray for him. I said, Justin's going to see how you respond in all of this. And you need to make sure you keep your joy complete. And I said, let him know, you know, this is going to hurt and we're trying to save money. Yes, but if he's, if he's used to seeing people call him on the phone and curse about it, and he's used to hearing people be negative about things. I don't know why I can't catch a break. I don't know why. Well, guess what? It's a floor. It's a piece of wood. Yeah. It's old. Things happen. You guys have to maintenance this building, I'm sure. It hurts when you have to write the check for when things go bad, I'm sure. We don't want to spend our tithes and offerings on a building maintenance, do we? We'd rather be spending it on missions and doing other things, but sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. And our response has to be in line with who we are in Christ. That's what he says here. Consider it a joy when we face these various trials. And then he explains why here in just a moment, but I want you to continue to think about your mindset. There was a great motivational speaker. Some of the older folks here will remember Zig Ziglar. Zig used to say, your attitude determines your altitude. He was a good Christian man. He found the Lord in his 40s. And one of the reasons you don't see his books in the bookstores as much anymore is because that can't have any of that Christian philosophical thought in with all this business stuff. But he was a good man and his stuff is still worth reading. But he used to say, your attitude determines your altitude. How high are you going to fly? How much are you going to be able to accomplish for the Lord? What are you going to be able to do? Because not everybody here is called to be a pastor. Some of you are called to do other things, and thank God you are, because there's some things I can't do, like I said. So if you're called to be someone that passes out the carts at Walmart, if you have to deal with somebody's kid tearing those things down and having to fix stuff back up again, you know, we have to be joyful in just about everything that life gives us. People need that. People want to see it be genuine in our lives. Yeah, right. And when we go through something, when we have close friends, people that you're praying for, that you'd say, God, I wish I could reach these people. Give me an open door. Listen, when you're going through something, that might be the open door that you need to minister to their heart. Because they're going to ask you, why are you different? Why are you not carrying on and complaining? Why are you not, ups don't you see what's happening? You're following Jesus Christ, your car's broke down, the house needs work. Golly, it doesn't seem like God's doing much good in your life. And the way you respond could be the determining factor in whether they ever open their hearts to the truths of the gospel because to those people, these are just words in a book. Yeah. And it's getting harder and harder to get people to read them. 
Do you know what the statistics are of Christians today reading their Bibles every day? 50%? Try less than one in five read their Bibles every day. How on earth are we going to have a relationship with someone that we don't want to talk to more than a half hour a week? Goodness. If we don't live, put these words and take them in and live them, no one's going to care what we think or where we go or what we say. That's the first part. So to me, I think James starts off with this, this way for that reason. Your attitude. Get your attitude in check. And then he tells us why in the next verse. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. It helps to know why when we're going through things like this. I don't have to get personal with anybody here. I bet if I went through and asked everybody in these pews, somebody would have a story to tell. There would be at least a handful, if not everyone. But as you go through trials, you're being strengthened. It's like running a race. You get out and you run a mile. Pretty soon you can run a mile and a half, then maybe two, then maybe three. Then you start doing other things and you find yourself getting stronger. Listen, God wants you to grow in your faith. And when you go through these things, he's building endurance in you. He's helping you to be able to help somebody else. So after you've gone through this a few times and people have seen, hey, he's not going to be moved or she's not going to be shaken by this. Then all of a sudden you can Come along somebody that's where you were maybe five years ago that's just getting started on the first mile and to you that's nothing now because you've handled far greater things than what this person is now dealing with. If anyone's in a position to tell somebody what God can do in their life, it's you because you were hardened and endured because you did what God told you to do and you've grown in your faith, you've grown in the knowledge of Christ, you've stayed in the word and you're stronger for it. You can minister to somebody else. And guess what? The great thing is, no offense to the pastor, because I have been one, I am one, but you don't have to worry about calling Josh and going, hey, I've got a friend who I think needs a visit. You could do the visit. You could do it. That's what Ephesians 4 tells us. We're supposed to be training you up to go out and do the work of ministry. We don't hire hired guns to do professional pastor work. We have a congregation of living souls who've got life experiences that build a beautiful mosaic of color that can minister to just about every need that could ever come through this congregation. But you've got to want to get off your duffs and do something. And do it every day. Look at the colors in this glass. I know these are bulbs and you, you got things here and change it. Blue would be great. Red would be great. Yellow would be great. It's kind of nice when we mix them up, isn't it? Josh is one color. I'm one color. My color's probably a little wider, a little shorter, but you know. But we're two different colors, but you guys are a multitude. And God wants to use that. God wants to use you to minister to people. You want revival? You want to see people come to faith? You want to see these, these front pews filled out? I'm glad to see that still hasn't changed in Free Will Baptist. First two, three rows. You got the deacon and the guest preacher and everybody else is in the back. If I was to tell you that Ozzie Smith was here, I bet every one of these front rows would be filled. And if you don't know who Ozzie Smith is, you're not saved. So, <laughs> okay, okay. That's one good thought about being back here. Thank you, Lord, for the Cardinals. Um, Rockies were great, but it was better when the Cardinals were there in September and I could go see the Cardinals. But honestly, we want to see people's lives changed. So if we're going to do that, it's got to happen organically through you. And it comes when your attitude's in check and when you go through these trials instead of, I mean, you don't have to just be joyful. Oh, great, my car's broke down. Another witnessing opportunity. It's just, hey, it's what happens. It's what happens. And all of a sudden, a couple years down the road, you're like, ah, that's where I'm at now. 
You know, I'm not that old, I'm 51 now. Hard to believe, but yes, I can now say I've entered my 50s. That, when I came to J98, I was 22 years old. I was two years younger than my son. That's hard to believe. I'm 51 now. And I look at things in life, and I, I told my daughter, because she's going through stuff, and I look at my wife, and sometimes, she's like, the whole house is just burning down around me. And I look at my wife and go, <laughs> remember when we said that? You know, and we got through it. We had a little house here in Farmington on Yale Street. I mean, everything. The to we babysat the Chilton's kids when they were itty bitty. They know, Sandy knows, Sandy remembers when my toilet went through the floor. And I looked at my wife and said, hmm, that smarts a bit, doesn't it? Now how are we gonna fix that? I just put new flooring down too. That, another trip to Hoods. <laughs> Another trip, to, I was hoping that if I covered it up, the wood would just go away, but it didn't work. So I told my daughter, I said, look, I said, things happen. You'll be stronger for it in the end. You know, she's smart, she saved a little money. I said, just get it fixed. Move on, start saving again, because something else gonna break in a year. You know, it just happens that way. So our attitude and then our understanding, knowing that God's using it to prepare us to minister to other people. You have a whole congregation of different lifestyles, different life experiences. Use it. Use it for the kingdom. Probably never thought of it that way before, but think about it. You could be someone special. You're unique. Nobody else is like you. Your life experience is tailor-made to minister to somebody, at least one. And if you could minister to that one, if every one of you has just had one, and there's most of you here have more than one, think about what could happen here. Think about what you could do, and think about the impact on the kingdom, more importantly. That's what we should be focused on. Right, right. The last thing. He says, let endurance, he moves on, let that endurance have its full effect. That's kind of what we're talking about. So that you may be what? Mature, complete, lacking nothing threefold these trials they make you stronger why keep the end game in mind you will be mature complete lacking nothing you see I can laugh a lot more now because of where I'm at now it used to hurt when the little things happened and then when I got into ministry, oh, Brother Gary, I, he's probably done, he probably forgot some of the stories I shared with him, but there was a couple, because even pastors need someone to talk to. And he was one trusted companion, and I said, you know, I can remember sharing one story with him about a guy that left, and he just smiled real big, and he goes, well, I, gee, it's not the first time I ever heard that happening before. In other words, you know, you're gonna mature, you're gonna grow. I was in my early 30s then. And I remember him smiling and walking me through that. You probably don't even remember that. <laughs> Maybe you do. By the time I left Denver, I'd had that story play over at least another 20, 30 times. And I'm not meaning to make light of that, but you know, as a pastor, when I'd get someone that'd say, I need to meet with you and talk about the ministries of the church, I'm like, okay, the translation is, I'm not getting fed and I'm leaving. And I already had prepared myself for whether I felt it was justified or not. Because the end result didn't rely on me. I realized that a little later. Probably should have remembered it a lot sooner. And I will give you this. You're blessed with your leadership here. You have a good pastor. You really do. He didn't pay me to say that. I'll just tell you from knowing his heart, from talking to him. He, you have a really good, loving concerned shepherd who can, is, is concerned for you. And you're blessed. You're blessed. You're very blessed. I would almost have to watch my heart that I didn't get so hardened at times when we didn't blend with this family or that family. Had another pastor put it this way. He said, Scott, there's only one way to look at it. Here's the pie. This is God's pie. And then he took a pencil and he drove a little bitty sliver. He goes, that's your piece of the pie. Do you think everyone in this world is going to fit in your piece of the pie? 
No. And he goes, are you doing anything wrong? He goes, if I thought you were doing anything wrong, I'd keep you in check. Good brother up in Brighton, Colorado. I still chat with him. Nice, nice guy. And he said, I chased off more people than are now attending the congregation, and we have a thousand people here. And he said, our piece of the pie is slightly larger than yours, but it's still just a sliver. And he said, focus on service. Serve the people, love them, be obedient to Christ. Let God sort out who fits in your piece of the pie. But see, I think sometimes we just want to focus on, well, this is just the way it is. This is never going to change. And because I'm going through what I'm going through, I have nothing to contribute. Listen, if you're going through a trial or you've been through trials and you feel like you've been through all these wars and you have nothing to contribute, take heart because you might be the greatest soldier this church needs to reach the lost for Christ. Think about that. When you change your attitude, you shift your altitude, you understand the patient endurance, and then you understand the outcome, your maturity, your growth, complete, lacking in nothing. I'm going to share one quick story with you. Make sure I honor your time. Have I got time for one quick story? Okay, I'll be quick, I promise. If not, Gary can rope me in. I was going through a really hard time about four years ago. And I knew God was, you know, God hadn't moved to close our window and have us move out just yet. But I had a really bad day. If you can talk about having a really bad day. I just had a bad day. So I got all of my stuff together after church. And I told my wife... I'm going to go to South Denver as far away from this place as I can so nobody can find me. Nobody will stop me in the bookstore and sit down and complain to me. That's how pitiful I was. And I said, I'm just going to sit because then I remember it was this time of the year because I had to do my taxes. So I thought, what better punishment for an awful day than for me to sit and do my taxes on a Sunday night? So, So I went and sat at a coffee shop in Littleton, Colorado, right outside South Denver, And I was doing my taxes, and all of a sudden, I got a call. I got a phone call. Some of you know who Brother Curtis Lenton is, right? Some of of you have been in Free Will Baptist a long time. Brother Curtis's church called me out of the blue and said, we have a gentleman that we need a visit to. Could you make a visit? And I was thinking, you know what? I am not in the mood to make a visit. I am having a bad day. I am in the midst of a trial. I don't know where God's taken me with this. I don't see any endurance in any of this. I just want to sit here and drink my coffee and do my taxes. And I started to say no. And he said, please, could you please? I'm I'm begging you. Nobody wants to go see this guy. And he goes, it's a brother of a family member and he's dying. And I said, well, you know, this is what I thought was going to be my out. I said, "Well, well, Curtis, I'm... I'm actually all the way in South Denver. And he goes, perfect, that's where he's at. God had taken my pitiful, poor, poor, pitiful me and put me right where the phone call went. And I never went there. In 15 years, I was in that coffee shop one time that day. Never went back because I was afraid of getting another phone call. (laughs) And I said, what hospital? Denver General. It's where everybody went when you didn't have insurance. And I mean, it was run down. It was the older hospital. So I look out my window. Guess what's in the window? Denver General. I could walk there. So I thought, I looked up. I said, God, you've got one sense of humor here. I said, all right, I'll go. I won't get into too much details, but I will tell you this. I went there. And the gentleman couldn't even speak. He was in such a bad shape, he could not talk. And his brother was there crying. And his wife was there, and she was obviously not a believer because she looked at me and said, what a horrific waste of time. That's the first thing she said to me. Who called you? What a horrific waste of your time. Just leave. And I thought to myself, that's what I was trying to do, was leave. But I'm here. And she, and I didn't say that to her, but I, not, thank you for coming, Pastor. Glad you answered the call. She said, what a horrific waste of your time. You should just leave. And her husband, the brother, looked at me and goes, please don't. And she goes, don't listen to him. He's holding out hope that his brother, it, you know, he's lived this horrible life. And she went down his list of sins. 
in front of the brother. I was thinking about Job and his wife. <laughs> you know, she just, she was tearing this poor guy up and she said, he deserves to die. I kid you not, I've got the picture on my phone to prove it. And I looked at her and I said, shame on you. And I probably shouldn't have said that, but I did. And I said, I'm here because God sent me here, not because your pastor called. I said, and I looked at her and for the first time in my ministry, I was actually a little honest. I said, if I'd have had my way, I'd still be drinking coffee and doing my taxes. But he called and asked me to come over here and I prayed and God sent me here. So I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna talk to your husband. And she just, whatever. She goes, go talk to him and his loser brother. And she walked out. It was almost like she was perturbed to be there. And he had done some really bad stuff. There, I don't need to tell you, but think of the bad things and then times that times 10. He was an awful dude. So I go there and I grab his hand and I'm talking to the brother and for time's sake, I squeezed his hand. No response. I don't know. I still to this day, it, I, you know, I actually need more time, but I'll just tell you, I could not believe how God worked in this situation because the brother was a new convert, had not yet been baptized. That's why the wife was so upset. Then the other brother, he came to see him. The other brother was dying from a terrible disease brought on by his own sin and he was gonna die. I could see he was not far from death. By a miracle of God, he was able to squeeze my hand when they told me he wouldn't. That's what I'll tell you. And within a half an hour, I was able to lead that man to Christ. And I know it was legit because he started crying and even the nurse looked at me and the nurse said, that's not possible. It's a miracle. And she backed out of the room and she said, where did you come from? I said, the coffee shop down the road. <laughs> and I, we took the picture because his brother looked at me and he said, he says, he, he really, he took it in. He goes, how did that happen? And I said, because I'm gonna tell you something. And I shared with him what I've been telling you about in this message. I said, I was being selfish and God smacked me into not being selfish anymore. And I said, so I came here and he showed me something. He showed me how awful of a person I am for thinking that God's still not working in my life. And that even when I have a bad day, it's not as bad as guys like Jeremiah who never had one convert in all the years he tried to minister to the kingdom and nobody listened to him. And here I am sitting in my coffee shop whining because one lady told me my sermon was awful. That's all it was. And she was right. It was bad that day. I didn't, I, I don't, I just felt like I had mailed it in. And I said, and God's waking me up to this. This is God, it's not me. I am a broken, sinful, 46-year-old man at that point. And I said, I'm just standing here as a testament to his grace. And I looked at the brother and I said, we need to baptize him. And he goes, how are we gonna do that? I said, you're going to baptize him. So we went and got water from one of the fonts down in the chapel, because they wouldn't let him leave the bedside. And I, this is how God shows up, because one of his, the guy's friends, another bad dude, walks in, and I said, great, we need a witness to sign the certificate, you stick around. And he's like, oh, this is a God thing, I wanna get out of here. I said, no, you're gonna stay right here. We baptized that gentleman, and we sang a hymn, and he cried again, and at 12.02, I believe it was, a.m. the next morning, he passed away. It was his last chance. God had given him one opportunity and my selfishness almost robbed that man of eternity. His blood would have been on my hands if I'd have kept saying no. So what I'm here to tell you is, no matter how bad of a day you've had, no matter what kind of trial you're going through, I had been ministering at that time for 13 years there in Colorado. My church was fine. I was just being selfish because I let one person's words hurt me and it almost cost me and that gentleman because I don't know that anybody else would have went and seen him. And my heart was broken. I left that hospital and I cried all the way back to my car. I cried so hard I couldn't drive for half of an hour because I had let cynicism take over my heart for that day. And I had said to myself, and I thought, what kind of congregation should I deserve when the pastor's this cynical and his heart's not where it needs to be? You're lucky you don't have that. And God, just I think we go through that 
And it wasn't really me, it was just a bad day. But I want you to understand, we need you even in your bad days. This church desperately needs you in your bad days. This church needs you to get up, do something, change your altitude, understand the process, and go out and share the joy of Christ. Have joy in your hearts when you leave here today and be a witness to somebody that needs to hear that it's okay to have a bad day, it's just not okay to stay there. That they have to change where they are and that you're gonna be there to love them. You don't have to worry about anybody else, not your small group, although that's great. Not Gary, not Matt, not Josh, you. God's given you enough to be sufficient. You're enough to minister to these people. Will you do it? Is God changing something in you right now? Is he speaking to your heart and challenging you right now to be different, to change something? Maybe someone's on your heart right now. Why don't you stand with me for just a moment and close your eyes. And let me ask you, is God speaking to someone here right now? Is God speaking to someone's heart? Someone that's maybe, maybe you're not going through a bad day, but maybe your heart has changed and maybe there's something going on right now and God's put somebody on your heart and you're like, that's, that's me, I need to be different. I need to change and I need to be able to minister through the bad days. I need to be able to be there to be for somebody else. I need to make myself available so that I can serve God first then welcome them into this fellowship that is First Free Will in Park Hills. God, can you use me? God, can you use me? Let me pray. God, we thank you that you're challenging hearts. So Father, right now I pray that if there be someone here today that doesn't know you or is being challenged by what's been said today, Father, that they will let their lives be a light for the people that they're around. Everybody here has somebody that they influence. So Father, would you challenge them now? I put the results into your hands. I pray that the message has been received as you planted it, and I pray that it's been accepted as you've called me to give it. But now, Lord, I beg of you to let your Holy Spirit speak to the hearts that are here today, and if someone's been challenged, Father, may they respond today in Jesus' name.